Well, this is a little more intimate. You can't see this video, strangers, but the setting here is now more intimate than it used to be. We need to make sure that we keep up the pace because, again, we're moving up on exam number two, which is after the section on options. So that's still a ways away, but we have to make sure we don't fall behind because options are complicated. And so um, last time we talked exclusively about United States Treasury securities, and that's a fairly simple lecture to follow because they're easy to understand. <laughs> Today we take on the considerably more complex corporate securities, and so this one's a little more challenging. Now, uh, I left a slide in from last year because this had happened just before this time last year. I mentioned earlier that when IBM bought Red Hat, it caused a tremendous, caused a tremendous surge in the stock, and I guess I wrote that into the chapter and forgot about it. I had, thought I had a slide somewhere. But this was where Red Hat was well-known in the Linux community, but otherwise obscure company that IBM set its targets on, and they uh, bought them for $33 billion, and the effect upon the stock, as was, I think, explained in one of the chapters of the book, uh, staggering. And quite a number of Harvey Mudders made out with that because quite a number of Harvey Mudders at the time worked for Red Hat and had substantial stock options in Red Hat, uh, including Sage Wheel, uh, who was already very wealthy um, because he sold his company to Red Hat and got a two-year job extension to work for Red Hat, got Red Hat stock options in addition to his cash compensation. So Sage, who hates business, by the way, just absolutely hates everything associated with business, just keeps getting richer and richer and richer, accidentally, I guess. <laughs> Uh, now, we're in so many strangles, it's hard to keep them straight. This is not in the uh, handout set that I included on the slides because I didn't want it. That's part of public information. So we're in Google, Facebook, Apple, AMD, Lyft, and although it's not shown here, Uber, fairly sizable trades. Um, I made a decision on Google today, Google reports today. As you can see right there at the very top, the Google strangle was already at a 1000 um, $316 profit on a $5,000 trade. And I thought, man, that's, without even taking the risk of the earnings report, that's a really great rate of return. Uh, just just cash it in and take your $1,500 and run with it. But I did that last year on Facebook on a similar situation where I had about five or $6,000 invested in the strangle. And prior to the earnings report, Facebook started to run on probably insider information and was already churning a profit of about 1500 bucks, And, you know, that's just no risk. So I took it, and had I stayed in the uh, strangle, I would have made almost $20,000. So by getting out early, I cost myself about 18 and a half. I think what happened here is I did exactly the opposite. I think had I got out for my $1,400 profit, I would have had that, because I don't think Google's going to respond to their earnings report, so I'll end up losing 5000 So I told you I would give you examples of how I make mistakes <laughs> and lose money, so here's probably one of our first. Also, though, we have Facebook, Apple, AMD, and Lyft. AMD's a covered call option because I owned a lot of that stock, so the others are strangles. So when we get to options, we'll come back to this, and I'll explain what all of this is about. We do need, however, to get into the dry, dismal world of corporate bonds. <laughs> um, I like this world, but being like a finance guy, we like stuff that other people hate um, for whatever reason that, that defines us. Okay, here's the kinds of risk embodied in the yields of these kinds of financial assets. If you've read the chapter by now, and I hope you have, the discussion of categories of risk are actually at the very end of the chapter. And I decided to do that because there was no way I could adequately explain the categories of risk until you had actually seen examples of the risk beforehand. So I moved the summary description of categories of risk in the book to the very end, whereas in this lecture it's at the very front but I'm assuming that you've read the book chapter by now, chapter seven. So market risk, we've already seen. 
some evidence of because market risk is found even in treasury securities. And that's due to the capital gains and capital losses when interest rates fluctuate. You may recall that we ended that last lecture, lecture by showing a 30-year treasury bond that had swung between $95 and whatever the high price was at the time we looked at it, something like 135 or so dollars. And that's a secure, blue chip, couldn't be safer treasury security, and yet it demonstrates capital gain swings as big as Tesla on Tesla stock. Uh, due to capital gains and capital losses when interest rates fluctuate, all classes of yield-bearing financial assets have this type of risk. Uh, the longer the maturity, the higher the risk, and as we'll see later, that's mathematical. And as I just said, it's common to all assets, uh, including treasuries. Now, treasuries, however, don't have the second category of risk, and so we're introducing this today in our discussion of corporate bonds. Default risk. Default risk is found in corporate and municipal yield-bearing financial assets, and the emphasis for us will be on the corporate financial asset and are not present in treasuries, at least so far. Default, as the chapter explains, is simply the possibility that you simply miss a single coupon payment to uh, those who own your bonds. There's a more subtle kind of risk that is associated with ETFs. This is my own term because this isn't discussed by everyone, but I discuss it using this term called liquidity risk. And that is the risk that the bond markets may not be very liquid, especially in terms of crisis. And no matter what the market says the price of the bond is, you may not be able to sell it. And this is also true if you're an ETF with bond holdings. And so we'll wait until we get to the discussion of ETFs at the end of this lecture to come back to this class of risk. It's a risk associated with your inability to sell the security for a fairly extended period of time at any price. And then finally, credit risk, which is tied but not exactly the same thing as default risk, is the risk that some underlying agency, government, or corporation that has issued the yield-bearing financial asset experience a credit downgrade. Uh, when that happens, when the uh, ratings agency like Standard & Poor's issues a credit downgrade for the company or for a government, for example, which is not the same thing as assessing the a bond issued by that same entity, it's actually an assessment of their financial stability, uh, then all yield-bearing financial assets issued by that entity could suffer during a credit downgrade. I mentioned in this class that the credit of the United States government was downgraded about, I guess now about two years ago by Standard & Poor's because of the size of the budget deficits that we're running. That did not yet impact any treasury security values so far as I can tell, but theoretically at some point it could or it should. Okay, so we're going to see multiple examples of these other three. We've already seen examples of market risk. Interest rates rise, you have a capital loss on your note or bond. That's very simple. Now, to summarize corporate bonds and notes, uh, which I abbreviate CBNs in the literature, this is, of course, a major funding source for large corporations, and it's used extensively by them. They're raising money hand over fist in this market these days because interest rates are so low, and it's a very cheap source of credit for corporations. There's thousands of listings at every maturity. That is to say, if you're looking for something in the 10-year range, thousands of listings for that. Something in the ultra-long term, like 30 years, thousands of listings for that because there are so many borrowers in there. These are subject to default risk. And for the largest part, even though you might, in a subjective sense, identify the type of risk associated with a corporate asset as being subtly variable or due to this in one case, that in another, as far as the bond rating agencies and the markets are concerned, there's only one risk, and that's the risk of default. And the risk of default is not the risk of never making another payment, it's the risk of making of missing a single payment on your obligations. Now remember, the notes and bonds all pay periodic interest, and usually that's semi-annual. Some of them pay, uh, pay quarterly. Treasuries, we know, pays semi-annual. And so every six months or so, sometimes every quarter or so, um, 
an interest payment is due that is baked in to the coupon rate of the asset when it was first issued. If you miss that payment once, that's a default. And so technically, the risk that's being associated here is the risk of that happening expressed purely as a probability. It's very simple. Uh, these CBNs are, rated, are risk rated by credit agencies. The agencies issue two types of ratings. They issue a rating of the entity itself, like the corporation can have a credit rating, or even the United States government, or the government of Switzerland, uh, can, or the government of Japan can have a credit rating. But they also put credit ratings on the individual financial assets, uh, at least debt assets, that are issued by that, by that agency as well. So we can take a look at a... Um, Remember the old Pennzoil bond? Pennzoil doesn't exist as a corporation anymore, but back in the day, you would have a credit rating specifically for Pennzoil, a corporation, and then all of Pennzoil's bonds would be rated. Today, the example would be Verizon or T-Mobile because these big capital-intensive companies raise copious amounts of money in these bond markets. And it could be the case, actually, that Verizon is uh, the largest borrower out there right now. From time to time, they are. I don't know if that's true right at the moment. Uh, ratings and changes in ratings have a huge impact upon yields. If there's a change in a rating, boom, down comes the yield if it's bad, up goes the yield if it's good, excuse me, that's backwards, up goes the yield if it's bad, down goes the price if it's bad, and vice versa if it's good. Uh, even the highest rated corporate bonds and notes, the blue chips of the blue chips, they always have higher yields than treasuries of equivalent maturities. And so, in other words, if you take a 10-year Treasury note and you compare it to any other 10-year asset out there in the corporate sector, no matter what the rating of that corporate asset, it will have a higher yield than the Treasury. So the Treasuries are a foundation, and much of the game that is played in the investment community is playing the spread between Treasuries and corporate securities of various yields. And we'll see data that reflects how that's done in just a few minutes here. This is a playground only for professionals. This is no place for amateurs to be, except for maybe ETNs and then only ETF-style ETNs of investment-grade assets only. Why does it make sense for a AAA-rated company to have a higher yield than a, than a AA-rated uh, treasury? Treasury bonds are rated AAA. It's the it's the U.S. Treasury that has a credit rating that is AA. Oh. Okay. So you remember that. I didn't make that distinction, I think, the other day because you wouldn't have understood it. But, uh, again, you, the government itself is rated and their their securities are rated. So the the downgrade of, was of the government itself. Um, Diversified mutual funds can be a nice supplement to a balanced mutual fund portfolio, but then only if you're investing in bonds that you understand and investment-grade bonds at that. This is why I say numerous times in the chapters I write, just buy treasuries. There's no doubt about their relative safety. And that's a minority argument to be sure. Most investment professionals advise people to get treasuries, but also a mix of at least investment grade corporate. But I don't think investment grade corporates are priced properly. So I say, you know, for that part of your portfolio that is there to avoid risk, just use treasuries for that. Um, a minority position to say the least. Now, bond ratings and def bond ratings are complicated, and that's why in the chapter I provide this sort of summary overview of them. This is from the chapter, and at the end of the chapter I have the actual rating categories that's used by Standard and Poor's, which is like three times or four times the size of this. That's a simplified version of the ratings, and Appendix 4 of Chapter 7 has a full listing and a full explanation for what the ratings are. I want you to get a sense of what these letters mean if you ever do any investing uh, so that you'll kind of understand the level of risk that's implied with the type of asset that you're buying. Because if you, for example, buy an ETF, and I'll talk about three major ETFs at the end of the lecture, they at least tell you the class of bond in which they invest. And if they say investment grade, then that means that they're investing in the type of bond that's represented here in the green. 
and all the subcategories that I'm not showing here, such as the little pluses and the minuses, if the major category is in the green, like triple B is in the green, then all the triple B extensions are also in the green, and also investment grade. So investment grade, if you're using the Standard & Poor's global ratings, uh, which I use, range from triple A down to triple B. And this is a, a very antiquated system that's never been changed um, and probably should be. So triple A is extremely strong, almost no possibility of default. There are no triple A rated corporate securities remaining in the United States. None, not one, all right? Those, the last of them disappeared about five years ago. So nothing's rated AAA in the United States. Treasury securities are rated AAA, even though the Treasury itself is not. AA is very strong, default, extremely unlikely. A is strong, although possibly vulnerable to strong adverse environments. So if something bad happens, like an unanticipated downturn, then this has a possibility of default. Now, in a minute, by the way, this is going to be translated into pure probabilities, all right? So there's two ways of approaching this. The subjective way of the language of the bond ratings and the specific probabilities that are assigned to these categories. And then triple B, strong protection parameters, but weak if faced with adverse conditions. All of those bonds fall in that category of triple B. Now, the most common corporate type of bond these days released is triple B, followed very closely by double B. So most all corporate material that's released by at least stable corporations is in the triple B, double B category. Double B is regarded as a junk status or high yield status. Although as you can see, there's a big range for what we call junk bonds. BB is vulnerable to uncertainties. Uh, and then you go down to B, single B, that you're getting into something there that has a pretty high default rate actually. Uh, able to meet financial commitments, but very vulnerable to adverse conditions. Then triple C, this is where if you see a C in there anywhere, you're talking about something that is really risky. Vulnerable to default, dependent upon favorable conditions to avoid default. And then below that, it's uh, basically cruising for a default. So anything below double B, or including double B, is uh, junk status. And so when you take a look at junk uh, mutual funds, for example, and junk uh, ETFs such as JNK, the one that's called junk, most of their inventory is on these uh, double Bs and some Bs for the largest part. They don't really have much of an inventory in the triple Cs. Of course, if it's D, that it actually is in default. Uh, now, if you're a mutter with a math background, you're saying, man, that's kind of vague. <laughs> you know, This is uh, extremely strong. What do you mean by extremely strong? Well, we can take a look at this uh, in terms of shifting statistics in this next graph. Now, by shifting, what I mean is that they change these all the time. And the way they change them is not always accessible to the public. You'll notice when I have my write-ups on these bonds, they're in the dating of the material I'm using is ranges from about three years old, in a couple of cases even older than that, up to very current. And that's because it's hard to get this data free. I subscribe to Standard & Poor's and I have to pay a little fee for that. But even there, I can't get their most expensive data. I would have to pay a lot more than I'm paying to get that. The only way you can get this is they leak the data out in advertising their services. And so I'll see the advertisement, grab the data, it shows up in a lecture. That's the only way I could get half this stuff. So this is an example of that, and that's why this is not current. This goes back to 2010 only. But conceptually, this is correct, even though the percentages shown here would no longer be valid. Now, this little three-dimensional graph sort of tells you what the probability of default is thought to be over the years as they pass based upon the rating. And so the rating, as you can see, goes from double A or triple A, excuse me, all the way up to triple C. Now, if you take a look at the triple A row in the front, even when you get out to 15 years, if you have a 15 year asset, its probability of default is something like one or two percent, as you can tell by inspection. But when you get to the first of the investment grade, I mean the first of the junk grade, which is, we said back here was a double B, 
by the time you get to seven years, you can see that you have about a seven or eight percent default rate. By the time you get to 10 years, you have about a 16 or 17 percent default rate. And by the time you get to 15 years and you have a default rate that's probably about 20 or 22 percent. For single B, and there's a lot of single B bonds out there, as you can see, as soon as you get past 10 years, you get default rates in excess of 15 percent. Now, that's high. As I point out in the chapter, if your bond goes into default, it doesn't fall to zero because it has liquidation value, typically settled by a bankruptcy court. But you will only get 25 or 30 cents on the dollar for that security, and it will take a long time for that to be freed up. It can take years to get your money back on a defaulted bond. So basically, if you held a bond that is rated double B, and it's a 15-year bond, within 10 years, it has a 10 or 15% probability of default. And its value would plunge, if that happened, to something between, say, 25 cents to 35 cents on the dollar. And so that's the nature of the risk that you're taking on that. Now, by the time you get up to even single B, you can see default rates within 15 years go to as high as 40% or so. And so basically you can translate this language like extremely strong and so forth into mere probabilities. The probabilities shift around a little bit over time as they constantly reassess actual default rates for these securities. And they, uh, sometimes that's published, and I have a couple of those that are published that are fairly current. So the uh, emphasis this last two years in the Standard and Poor's literature has been between triple B and double B because there's so much of it out there, over half of the corporate bonds outstanding are either triple B or double B, which means they're right on the cusp of being investment grade versus junk grade, that they're getting interested in the default rates for these securities because it kind of forebodes what we'll see in the future. Now, however, uh, the data shows that the default rates are sporadic, which is to say that if you're talking about one investment grade level or one like a triple B, then for many, many years, the default rate will be low for that for three or four percent. And then why they keep saying adverse conditions, when those adverse conditions arrive, then the default rate for that same class of securities will soar to 20 percent for the next two or three years or so. It's also the case when you think about this, that as a bond turns bad, it may have been a bond first issued at double A, and it goes down through the ratings before it defaults, usually, not always. Uh, so it starts at double uh, A, then it goes to A, then it goes to triple B, then double B, then B, then finally to triple C, then finally to default. So that is uh, sometimes the history of the bond. And as it comes down, of course, the yield on the bond will rise as the, as the value falls. So as we say here from this example, the a triple C over C junk bond defaulting rate within two years is 30%, and then within seven years is above 45%. Quite a bit of the paper out there is being financed at this rate. Um, so now this is more current. This was actually in a recent publication. These are the cumulative default rates that they represent to show um, what happens over the years. Now the cumulative default rate is the only one that really matters. So you say, it, it, it is sometimes interesting to say, well, how many of these bonds defaulted in their seventh year? But basically you wanna know, if you have a 30 year bond and it's rated double B, by the 10th year, how many of those have defaulted? That's what this is addressing, right? By the 20th year, how many of those have defaulted? Or if you're just talking about 10-year notes, you say, well, by the second year, out of that whole batch, how many defaulted? By the sixth year, how many defaulted? So, of course, as time goes on, the cumulative rate begins to rise, as you can see. And you can, it's surprising to see how much it rises. Now, we don't care about the triple C. You should never be invested in those. But take a look at the, uh, the uh, point, little point B and point, little point A. All right? So A is in reference to a, a bond with a originally issued as a B rating. Now, what this graph means is that this bond, when it finally did default, was probably not a B bond. 
The question is, how did it start? And so if it started as a B, then it's on the B line. When it defaulted, it was probably a triple C or a double C or even a single C. And so it moved down. So the question is, how did it start? So point B said that of bonds that started, uh, I mean, point A tells it bonds that originally issued with a B rating has a 20% probability of defaulting in less than seven years. That's actually almost a third of all corporate debt in circulation right now at the present time, the B and the double B. The double B is the rest of it. Point B, the little boy, says that if a bond originally issued as a BB rating has about a 14% probability of defaulting within 10 years. And then, of course, if you take a look at the true junk bonds, BB is a true junk bond, but the, the you know, the the uh, triple C, then of course within four years it has a 45% probability of defaulting. So, uh, so you look at this and say, wow, I mean a lot of this debt is um, double B and single B and it's issued out there. How come we don't hear of any defaults? Because as I say, it happens sporadically. It happens when the economy turns down. And what this means therefore is when we have a recession all of a sudden these default rates will explode upward and it will involve a very large amount of debt because so much of that debt is rated double B and triple B. And this is how it sort of averages out as uh, having the default rates that are uh, glossed out and smoothed out here, 20% in seven years, 14% within 10 years. Nobody's being in default right now. And the reason nobody's in default right now is because you can just continue to borrow money at low interest rates as much as you want, and so you can continue to borrow more money to bail out your untenable situation. When that stops happening, then this is all going to go straight to hell, and that's what everybody understands about this stuff. This is why we're watching the uh, strange indicators that nobody's paying any attention to except crazy economists of the repo rate incident that I brought up in class. That has now been systematized into a Federal Reserve operation to where they're expected um, this month alone to provide $70 billion to that market instead of the, treating it as a crisis that was going to be dealt with on a one-time or two-time, three-day or four-day basis. They've discovered that as soon as they pulled out of that market, then the repo rate would go right back up to 10 or 15% or so. So they got, saw the handwriting on the wall. They said, we have to provide reserves steadily to that, just like we were doing in quantitative easing. So effectively, this is a concession that no one is talking about, that we have now em, uh, embarked on a quantitative easing plan in the United States, unannounced, unofficial, yet again, that is actually more aggressive than the previous two, because the rate of purchases that they're doing is much higher than the rate of purchases that they were doing in quantitative easing three. Why are they doing it? No matter what they say, why are they doing it? So this doesn't go to hell is why they're doing it. Because if capital dried up suddenly for marginal borrowers, then these default rates for double B and triple B and even better level uh, investment, investment grade stuff would all of a sudden start to turn into defaults. And so it's just postponing the, uh, it's just postponing the inevitable probably by doing this or trying to figure out what the hell's going on. Nobody has yet to provide an uh, explanation for why they have to do this. And I, they had another article on Sunday in the Wall Street, or Saturday in the Wall Street Journal. No explanation about why this is necessary. No technical explanation about why this is necessary. It's just understood that it is. As I say, I think sometimes maybe the, the borrowers are, are boycotting um, government activities because of these low interest rates. These low interest rates are murder on bank profits. They make their profits on the spread, but when the level of rates is so low, the spread is narrow. So that impacts their profits accordingly. But that's just a guess on my part. Um, everybody's guessing about this right now. So this matters, and obviously the higher the default rate potential, the lower the rating, the higher the yield on the asset because it has to compensate for the fact that it has a higher default rate. Now, here's this is the point that I'm making. Historical default rates are not smooth. That's the problem. These are, this is current, I think. Um, 
yeah, this is 2017, but that's actually current. This was actually in a one month old document. Um, so uh, it was published at least to, for us to see. And so you can see it's not smooth. Spec, spec grader junk bonds is the orange and overall is the uh, blue. And investment grade is shown by those little bars down there that are hard to detect. So as you can see, it's mostly the spec grade stuff, but it's the higher end of it too, which includes the, uh, the double Bs and the Bs and so forth. It's not all triple C stuff. And therefore the default rate clips along like 1981, 82, two, three, 4% with very high yields and say, wow, this is the best investment. And then all of a sudden the default rate is um, 11%, meaning 11% of these things in one year went into default. And then it comes plunging back down as soon as there's a recovery. And then in 2000, 2001, the dot-com crash, back up it goes to 10%, plunging back down afterwards. And then in the mortgage meltdown, up it goes again to 10% again and plunging back down again. And so now, of course, it's destined to do exactly the same thing and repeat this cycle on the next downturn, moving again back up to the 10% level. But the composition of the debt in the United States has shifted now very, very strongly in the direction of junk bonds and away from investment-grade assets. As I say, there's not a single AAA investment-grade asset currently rated in the United States at the present time. And you go back to the time that we were looking at that little Pennzoil bond, about a third of all corporate issues were investment-grade. Now, this here is one of the things that you have to pay to get to. And so this one, uh, this, is, this is published every few minutes because it's a, it's a spread it's a spreadsheet that um, the people play basically in the markets. Now, I want you to understand this. I'll ask you at least a lightweighted question about this because this tells you at any given moment. Now, this is very dynamic. This, this is uh, changing every second effectively. And the publication of it is periodic like every minute or something like that if you subscribe to these. This one, again, I got from an advertisement from a company that tried to get me to subscribe to their service. I grabbed it and said, okay, I'll just use that. This shows the spread between treasuries and these corporate securities based upon the complex level of ratings that is in the appendix. So here we can see we not only have AAA and AA, but we got pluses and minuses and all that other stuff. So many more subcategories. But basically, we know it goes from bottom to top, right? So we start with one year and we go out to 30 year. And then we go down the ratings from uh, AAA down to, uh, to C, And the matrix is in basis points, and it's the spread between the asset class in question and the equivalent U.S. Treasury security. So let's take a look at the red arrow, 37. And that 37 tells you that there is a 37 basis point spread between a AAA rated asset of five years maturity and a five year U.S. Treasury security. And this is, uh, I guess this is U.S. only. Yeah, yeah, this is U.S. only. Okay. So 37 basis points. That's the spread between the two. So they're very close to each other, but it's positive. When we get out to the 10-year, then there's a 77 basis point spread. Now, again, that means that whatever the Treasury security is yielding, the AAA 10-year, whatever the 10-year Treasury note is yielding, the corporate 10-year note is yielding, uh, 0.77% above that, seven tenths of 1% or eight tenths of 1%. Now, when we get down into the junk category, of course, the spread widens. And so if we look at the blue hour, there we're comparing 10 years and the spread between a U.S. Treasury security and a, a junk bond rated B+. Plus. And that's not a very good bond. That's 385 basis points. Now, that means that the 10-year Treasury is almost four percentage points lower in yield than the 10-year junk bond. And that was the case in March of 2013. And so, for example, if the 10-year Treasury was 3%, 
then the junk bond would be 6.85%, the one referred to in the blue arrow. So this fluctuates all the time and tells you what the market is thinking about risk for the largest part. To subscribe to the service that allows you to look at this is like $1,000 a month. Uh, it's not something that even an academic has access to. It's really expensive to look at these uh, that are live. With a, with a uh, one-month uh, time delay, it's about $100 a month to look at this stuff. But even I don't want to pay that. Uh, this is current. This is U.S. corporate bonds by maturity. Now, this allows us to understand two things. One, that both uh, make sense. One is that the higher the risk, the higher the yield. And so you can see that the BB plus is the highest yield of the asset at all maturities. The A is somewhere there in the middle. Uh, and that's investment grade, low investment grade and it rises, and then the AAA is down there uh, at the very bottom, and then there's a treasury shown here, and the treasury is right underneath the AAA. It's, for whatever reason, they didn't have a, uh, uh, an in index that indicated that the treasury is there. So, of course, the riskier, the higher the yield, but also the longer the maturity, the higher the yield. So you expect these things to be spaced out like this and always going up. This is a relatively flat yield spread that reflects a relatively flat yield spread of treasuries right now and does represent some distortion in these markets. This should be a little bit steeper and typically is. But we can make generalizations from this that make sense. The higher the default rate, the higher the yield. The longer the maturity, the higher the yield and the two in combination. Now, knowing that, looking historically at this, Comparing 10-year, uh, for example, and 25-year, you can see that the yields rise and fall as interest rates rise and fall, a point that's been made numerous times already in this class, but the spreads between them are fairly consistent, although small fluctuations in the spread involve, by the way, huge bets in terms of dollars. Uh, arbitrage, the level of arbitrage that goes on in the bond market is absolutely staggering. And so here we're looking at the 10-year, and you've got the junks up there at the very top, the sort of lavender-colored lines. Then you have, as always, the Treasury down there at the bottom. And you can see that there are times when they deviate, like in 2009, Treasuries, there was a, sometimes there's a flight to safety in Treasury, and their prices don't follow the others because all the money's flowing into Treasuries during times of crisis. But generally speaking, when one rises, the other rises. When you get down to the 25-year maturity, you can see that uh, not only does, is that spread maintained and the characteristic is maintained, except for a couple of anomalous years like 2009 where Treasury started to move against some of the other players, um, we can also see that, although it's kind of hard to read on this graph, that both of these are near all-time lows for every category shown here. Um, we, they're not at all-time lows. They were lower in 2016. And if you take a look at the tail end of these, they were lower in 2016, not in every case. Treasury are at an all-time low right now, it looks like, according to this. I'm not sure if that's true, though. I'd have to go back and look. 2016, everything was at all-time low, and then it all started to rise. All of it did. You can see at the 10-year, the 25-year, of course, there's more charts for the other years. I'm just showing a sample here. They all started to rise, then they peaked, and then they came down again. Now, this was by intention to some extent. Remember, the Federal Reserve System decided in 2016 that interest rates were far too low in the United States and globally and that we would have no weapon to combat a recession if we went into a recession with these low rates because we could not use aggressive monetary policy to lower rates to stimulate the economy if they were already at 2%. And so the Federal Reserve System announced a policy to raise rates to stop their open market purchases, which they did. And for a period of time, that worked. And rates began to rise. And then, as you know, about a year ago, rates re uh, reversed and started falling again. And they're currently falling back down to the all-time lows that we saw in 2016. 
Now, we could be casual and say, well, that's because the Federal Reserve, in response to pressure coming from the president's office, decided to lower rates to get Trump off his back, for example. But the truth of the matter is, these rates actually started to fall months before the Federal Reserve System announced a reversal in policy. And as I said earlier in this class, it was really the case that the Federal Reserve System, I think to avoid embarrassment, announced a declining interest rate policy because no matter what they were doing, interest rates were going down. So you might as well have a policy uh, public announcement that's at least in conformity with reality rather than saying our policy is to be raising interest rates while interest rates are declining. Also, of course, to some extent got Trump off his back to the extent that anybody can get Trump off his back. And uh, uh, so now, unambiguously, they're on their way back down, and the Fed policy of 2016 is a failure. Uh, it means to me, largely, that the Federal Reserve has lost control over interest rates. In fact, I think the Federal Reserve has lost control over absolutely everything that they used to be able to control. This is at the root of the repo problem. Uh, but nobody quite understands it, including me, why, with $1.6 trillion in excess reserves, is there a penalty rate on overnight lent excess reserves, which is what the repo market is. Well, that's, well, that's, uh, that's inconsistent with the way these models are supposed to work. So as it stands right now, rates are very low on all categories of risk, including, as you can tell, there are... Uh, so take a look at the triple B. It's easy to see because it's kind of pink, right? Well, that's uh, up and down, but pretty much a steady downturn uh, with like a sine wave down or something, you know. Um, be, and right now, it's uh, by inspection, it looks like it's, it's the lowest it's ever been since this, uh, this um, graph was charted in 2004. And by the way, the rates going back before 2004 were considerably higher than anything being shown here. So this downward trend that is present here would be continuing. We'll see that in the next graph. So this graph you've also seen before. This is my own version of the same thing. But in this one, I compare it to the consumer price index. Because to some extent, the reason for the variations in the long run are explained by inflation. Uh, interest rates, commercial interest rates will always be positive. In, the, uh, in real terms. And so if inflation is rising, then nominal or market rates has to rise with the inflation. It doesn't do so perfectly. Sometimes it does so with a lag. Sometimes it does so uh, in a way that's kind of hard to understand in the short run. But inevitably, if inflation is rising, these rates are rising. If inflation is being pulled down or we're heading toward deflation, these rates come down with it. So when you take a look at the red triple A, uh, which is easy to see because it kind of stands out, it's clearly at an all-time low. Uh, this is 2018. It's lower now than it was in 2018. This is annual data. And you can see also that during the inflation years with the CPI drip, dipped down to 0% effectively for the year, and that was in 2009 and 2016, that a lot of the rates like the... Um, three-month T-bill rate came down to zero with it. The three-month T-bill rate has come back up to 2%, but now we have, as you know, a flat term structure of interest rates across the board at about 2%. So some of the ultra-short rates have risen above their 2016 level, but everything else has collapsed down to that 2% from the top. Now, for the corporate stuff, of course, all the triple A, double A, triple B, double B, B, all that, all of that has come down, of course, to the present level, as you can see. Uh, now, what this leads to is a point raised by the Wall Street Journal last week, and that is that current yields do not reflect true risk because they're too low. Across the board, they don't reflect uh, too risk. This is, of course, not just a, a concern of the Wall Street Journal and the Financial Times, where articles keep appearing about this, it's the concern of any economist that follows the financial sector. The yields are supposed to reflect the default risk realistically, and when they're all compressed to levels of, say, 3% and below, they don't. And um, this is kind of a hard graph to read, unfortunately. In fact, I can't even read the one in front of me. So you can see the U.S., the top one, the orange one, 
is U.S. High Yield Corp. and Emerging Markets is the, is the bright orange, and those are often tied to each other. And so we're comparing 2005 to um, the present, and you can see that the emerging market in U.S. High Yield Corp. is 5.5%. Now, 5.5% is within a half percent of where traditionally 30-year Treasury securities have been sitting, if you go back and look at, say, 50 years of data. About 4.5%, 5% is what, on average, 30-year blue-chip, AAA-rated United States Treasury securities have paid. Now, junk bonds pay the same level at 5%. And yet, we just saw some data, according to Standard & Poor's, that says that class of asset has an expected default rate of, um, you know, depending on which one you're talking about, 20% default in seven years if you're talking about B, 14% uh, within 10 years if you're talking about A. Uh, going back here, we're talking about the, um, the uh, lavender colored bars there in the back. And if we move forward, we're talking about assets that currently have a default rate of about 2%, historically having default rates of 10% when you have an economy that moves down into a recession. And yet they're paying currently the same yield as a 10-year treasury historically is paid in a time of no inflation. So there is some concern of a fairly wide-scale default and the bankruptcy that comes from default because of the underpricing of these assets. Now, these really, really yield, low yields are encouraging companies to just go out and ask for and receive more credit. I was following with absolute fascination the effort to bail out WeWork. And WeWork actually managed to get SoftBank and J.P. Morgan in a bidding war to issue them junk debt. And SoftBank came up with the best offer, so they didn't take the J.P. Morgan offer. But J.P. Morgan was effectively begging them to let them float about a $10 billion issue of uh, triple C rated debt. And they wouldn't do that unless they thought they could easily sell it. And it was going to yield about 6%, maybe 7%. It's kind of hard to say what the market would have taken. They, they felt they had no trouble with the reputation of this company <laughs> that isn't even a company. Uh, they would have no trouble selling that with a yield of only 6%, despite the fact that every single one of us can see a very likely default on that debt. Because what is that company going to do to ever, uh, ever maintain um, any profitability? So then you look on down the line, you can see uh, U.S. investment grade is at 2.5%. That's what 13-week treasury bills used to yield. And, you know, investment-grade long-term bonds now yield 2.5%. And then, of course, you can see at the very end there, Japanese and German 10-year notes have negative yields. They have yields of minus 1.5%, minus 1.25%. That's a, right now they're about uh, minus 1.25%. So you say to yourself, how can something have a yield of minus 1.25%? Uh, because it's a bond, right? It's a 10-year note. How can it have a yield of minus percent? Does it mean that you pay, you, you write a coupon payment and send it to the government of Germany every uh, six months? No, they actually have, of course you understand how this works now, based upon the Dutch auction example, right? You, they, the German government still pays interest. The coupon rate on those is positive, very slightly at about 0.25%. So they'll send you 25 cents for every $100 but how is it possible that it has a, uh, a negative yield? Because they're trading at 89, 90 bucks, or in terms of euros, 89 or 90 euros, not 100 euros. And so that makes their yield effectively below zero, negative. So they, they have a positive coupon, but with a negative market yield because they're trading, obviously, at a discount. Right? And so, excuse me, at a uh, premium. Sorry, I said that backwards. They're trading at a premium if they've got a negative yield. So that's how that's possible. Why would you ever buy that? Like, at that point, can't just Well, I wouldn't. I mean, great question. You're learning. You're learning great. This is great. You're learning something. The question was, why would you ever buy that? <laughs> I said, well, 
why would you ever buy the WeWork bonds from J.P. Morgan, right? Well, I'm telling you not to buy them. So the answer is I would never buy them in a million years. I think it's a, the stupidest thing you could possibly do. But it's, uh, they're being offered to the market and others are buying them. Uh, again, though, you do have the problem of the copious wealth out there having to park it in financial assets somewhere, right? So uh, the, uh, it's, it's, a, it's finding the best yield given the safety you can get. Now, I don't know how in Germany that still translates into a negative yield on a 10-year note, but it does. This thing has been sitting below zero. I look at it every day in the Wall Street Journal because they go look up the U.S. 10-year note. They're all together there. It's been negative for months. Uh, there's not been a single day where it's been positive for months, so somebody's buying them. But isn't that actually just worse than having like piles of cash lying around? Isn't that worse than what? Than just like piles of cash? Zero. Yeah, yeah, except that there's no way to hold piles of cash if you uh, have, say, $20 billion to deal with. You know, that's the issue. The old Scrooge McDuck notwithstanding, uh, Scrooge McDuck was, in fact, the smartest of all investors. He built concrete massive bins bigger than this building and filled them with nickels, quarters, dimes, <laughs> and currency and gold coin. <laughs> so... That's a much better rate of return than all this stuff we're talking about, right? Except that it's fictional. Josh Jones has a Scrooge McDuck collection of Scrooge McDuck artwork from, uh, from Disney. <laughs> you can't believe how much that stuff is worth. The original painting done in the 1950s of Scrooge McDuck jumping off of a diving board into the money bin is hanging on Josh Jones' living room wall. <laughs> I'm not sure what it's worth, but it's worth a lot of money. <laughs> worth almost as much money as the gold in that bin. Um, so here's a summary of some points that we're making. Okay, and these summary slides are important when you go back to prepare for the uh, examinations, right? Because mostly the, the, the heavyweight's going to be on making sure you understand this. And a lot of it's obviously, did he read the book or did she, <laughs> did she look at the lecture? You know, so let's ask a few things here and there that they're going to remember if they did and not remember if they didn't. But most of it's going to be based upon this stuff. Bond rating services rate corporate bonds based upon their uh, projected default rates. Bonds with higher default probabilities will have higher yields. But that's... I, you wouldn't have to remember this is so common sense that this would be true, right? Bonds with longer maturities also have higher yields. Interest rates for all of these rise and fall together, but conditions one through three will always hold. And so those aggregate slides we showed, you do show that they all rise and fall together. The spreads vary some, but they don't cross over or anything like that. Any table that shows bond spreads compared to treasuries with ratings on the vertical axis, high to low, and maturities on the horizontal axis will show spreads rising from left to right and top to bottom, like that little sign right there. They'll always do that, right? The longer the maturity, the higher the basis point spread, and the higher the risk, the higher the basis point spread. So those little matrices always fan out from very close to no basis points, maybe 20 basis points, down to five or 600 basis points for 30-year stuff that's rated triple C. Higher yields, therefore, imply higher risk. And that's going to be the sort of touchstone of uh, how you invest in these securities or what you need to think about. Now, it's for this reason that I tell people running a retirement account, you just stay away from all the stuff that isn't investment grade, and you shouldn't have much of a problem. Although, as you know, you will always have market risk, no matter what you have. This is not a time to be buying long-term United States Treasury securities, because you can suffer significant market risk a decline in the value of the bond if interest rates start to rise. Okay, now there's a big section in uh, the book about agency debt. And I told you some of this stuff I'm going to sort of tell you you don't have to worry about. And this is one of them. So this is a figure nine, a summary of all that discussion of agency debt. Uh, just know what it is for exam purposes. Remember, this is government-sponsored enterprise debt for the largest part. And I gave examples of F uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. You know, these are housing-based uh, bonds and the like. They're huge. It's a quiet market. 
and the amount of debt outstanding matters. It's two trillion dollars as if. Uh, but all the detail that I have is just so you'll know that that's there. I'm not going to ask you anything about the detail. You need, you need to know that there is such a thing as an agency debt market for these uh, Federal Home Loan Bank and stuff like that, Tennessee Valley Authority, you name it, there is something out there. But uh, these are largely equivalent to treasuries with higher yields, and we don't need to worry too much about them. Kind of the same thing for municipal bonds. Uh, those used to be very popular, but because of low yields on everything now, they no longer are, and maybe at some point they will be. There's two things uh, I want you th to remember about munis, because it may come up. One of those is the distinction between a general obligation bond and a revenue bond. Those matter a great deal. The revenue bonds are uh, typically secured by an income stream of some kind or another. So if you pass a highway construction bond that is secured by higher gasoline taxes, that is a revenue bond. Whereas if you just pass a bond saying, let's borrow $20 billion and build some highways with it, and let's hope the state of California pays it back, then that's called a general obligation bond. Uh, these are tax-free with many restrictions. By tax-free, I mean that the income earned on these is not taxable. But that's true only if you're uh, a resident of the state that issues the bonds for um, state and local taxes. So if you buy a muni bond and it pays 4%, you'll never have to pay federal income tax on that interest. But if you're from the state of Illinois and you buy a California bond, or let's say better, I don't know if Illinois has an uh, income tax. If you're from California, you buy an Illinois bond, then you have to pay California state tax on the interest on that bond. That's something you don't do for two reasons. You don't want to pay the tax. You don't want to have to deal with figuring it out on your tax form either. Uh, that kind of sideshow stuff on filling out your taxes is a nightmare sometimes. It goes on and on and on. Fill us in. Take that exemption, subtract from this, look this up in that table, add it to this, subtract it from that, you know, on and on and on. You don't want to have to deal with that stuff. If you're living in California and you want to buy munis, buy California munis. That's the, uh, they have lower yields though reflecting their tax-free status and that's the reason they're not very popular because if they have lower yields than everything else, we said everything else is at record lows, the yields on these things have to be close to zero and they are. Now, so, Muni bonds, the two things I want you to know about them or remember are the general obligation versus revenue and the, the general, the, the crude tax laws I just stated. These, uh, I'm not going to ask much about either. In the book, I have a more accurate diagram that I'm using right here. Um, the reason I have this is because when we get to, otherwise I could just say, forget it, because these are now being regulated out of existence for everything except mortgages. These used to be the fastest growing debt category that there was, but now they're being regulated out of existence, so why talk about them? But you need to understand the concept, because when we get to why the world had a mortgage meltdown, it's because of this structure that it did. And so we're going to introduce ourselves to it right now. Now, when we get to the real estate section of the class, we're going to be looking at um, CMOs, uh, collateralized mortgage obligations. Here we're looking at CDOs, also called asset-backed securities, which are debt obligations not associated with mortgages. Your student loans are all done this way, even now, even though this is being phased out. So student loans are all done this way. Credit, ob credit card obligations for a long time, this was dominant, now it's being phased out. So you take a credit card balance or a student loan or an auto loan, and these private lenders consolidate these loans into a big pool. Then they collateralize it into what is called an asset-backed security, a single security. And they sell the interest flow from that security to investors. That's about how it works. So you get all these credit card loans, all these auto loans, all these student loans, and you pool them all together so everybody making a payment for your credit card, your student loan, for your uh, 
auto loan. Some of them pool multiple assets like this example here. Some are just credit cards. Student loans are typically just student loans, for example. They consolidate them into this asset, and then you bid on the right to earn the interest from those payments. Now, it's a, it's a stochastic loan because unlike a bond or a note where they say this is the coupon payment you get every six months, the payment here depends upon the cash flow coming from the payments being made by people paying off their credit cards and their student loans. So it's stochastic. It's variable, right? And so these things are kind of popular for that reason, and that's how they differ. It's the concept of no fixed payment to the investor that you need to understand. Because when we return to collateralized mortgage obligations and say, why was the globe nearly destroyed? There was a defective type of financial asset out there that caused that, and it's this, except for mortgages. So I'm introducing it to you here for the first time. If I ask anything about this at all on the exam, it's going to be like a couple of true-false questions or something, right? And the real key thing to remember about these, they collateralize our assets into one big pool, then they sell the interest flow only to investors. The description of the book is in much greater detail than what I'm talking about right here, but this is all I'm expecting you to understand. Okay, in the small amount of time remaining, I have to make sure we get through this. Uh, here's something that we need to really, really understand well. Now we're going back to market risk, and in the next chapter, which is pure mathematics, which I'm going to deliver by the video, as I said before, uh, this is established mathematically, all right? We're saying here that bond market values and market interest rates move inversely. And we saw examples of that when we looked at the Treasury securities. When interest rates rise, bond and note rates when interest rates rise, bond and note values fall, that should say. Capital losses are possible in a rising rate environment. In fact, capital losses are inevitable in a rising rate environment. Here's an example. A 30-year bond, 10 years after issue, given a range of possible interest rates, this is where we're going to start Chapter 8 when we get to it. Here we're just establishing the principle. Let's suppose this bond was issued at par equals 100 and it was an 8% bond using examples from the 60s and 70s when interest rates were higher. What we're saying is this shows the full range of ask yields possible for an original 30-year bond with an 8% coupon 10 years later when compared to a new 20-year bond with possible yields shown on the bottom axis. So the way you interpret this, if you look at the 10%, you can say, what does that represent? That says that a 20-year bond right now has a yield of 10%. Your bond has a coupon of 8%. So for your bond to be equivalent to the new 20-year bond, your bond has to sell at a discount. It has to sell at about $80 relative to par. So in, in an environment where interest rates have risen, as is the case of 20-year rates have gone from, say, around 8 to 10, then this bond falls in value from 100 to 80. In an environment where interest rates fall, such as from 8% to 5%, the value of this asset will rise, as is shown here from par to, in the case of 5%, about 125. Now, remember, if you look back at the example of the 30-year Treasury bond that we priced one year ago, and then last week, we saw that there was a fluctuation that was huge in that bond's value between 95 or 98 or something like that. It was trading actually at a discount last year to a much higher value today. Basically, this is the phenomenon that we were looking at. Now, this is just conceptual right now. Chapter 8 goes to great pains to show mathematically why this has to be true. This introduces the possibility, though, of sizable capital gains and capital losses in the bond markets when interest rates fluctuate. Again, understandably, where if rates rise, these things fall in value. If rates fall, these things rise in value. So therefore, if you say, well, rates are at historical lows across the spectrum for all maturities and all default possibilities, then if interest rates rise, 
that means that the whole category of assets will begin to experience declines in value. And there will be sizable capital losses in the bond markets in general because of the truth of this. Now, we just need to remember that because we know that interest rates go up and down. They always have historically, and they're going to continue to do so in the future. So that will guide our long-term perspective on how to include bonds in our portfolio. This has to still go a long ways to talk about portfolio analysis, but we'll get there to where you can say generally something very sensible about how you handle bonds in a portfolio. Let's look at some options that we have. Select bond ETFs. So you've got the one to three treasuries, SHY. I own a lot of that stuff. You have three to seven year treasury, IEI. And then of course the 20 year plus down there, tilt, which I trade but don't own much of. Uh, this is one of the ones you jump into. These are ETFs that have inventories of treasury securities in these maturities. You already saw the way tilt is made up. That's reflected in chapter seven of the book and it was in the last lecture. Tilt has a long list of United States Treasury long-term bonds in it. Corporate, these are very, very heavily traded. LQD is investment grade. That's the big one, right? That will sometimes be the leading ETF on any given day. Often SPY is the ETF that's the top of the volume, but if it's not SPY, it's often LQD or JNK. Um, JNK is the, the junks right, the low grade, uh, heavy volume. Then uh, we got a couple of vanguards there. And then we got a total bond market that's popular, JP Morgan Emerging Markets and uh, International Bond and so forth. So there's a lot of uh, ETF representation for all classes of bonds out there. And this is just the tip of it. These are the ones you would probably want to trade in because liquidity is really a big issue on bonds. And you want to be in something very liquid Figure six shows just the treasuries, the uh, one to three, the three to seven. So every category of asset out there, you say, well, you know what? I want to hedge my portfolio, but I don't know a damn thing about bonds. I don't know how to hedge it in bonds. It's very easy to hedge it this way. You say, well, I want to hedge it in short-term treasuries. I know I'm not going to get much in the way of yield, maybe no more than 2%, but it is as safe as something can possibly be. And you say, okay, take a third of your portfolio and invest it in SHY, the one to three. That's not going to go anywhere. Because even though these things fluctuate with interest rates, a two-year note really doesn't fluctuate very much. Because if you're unhappy with the market yield, you just wait for it to mature. It's going to be at a maximum two years. Uh, on the other hand, if you say, uh, I really want to take advantage of the treasury long-term stuff, then you go to tilt. But you'd be out of your mind to invest in tilt right now because tilt's very high priced and that's because interest rates for long-term securities are at record lows. So tilt is simply asking for capital losses. Tilt a month ago was trading for 145. They have these things structured such that they trade more or less relative to par. Not truly mathematically relative to par, but kind of. So if it's trading at 132, the bonds in there are more or less kind of around that level of premium, right? Not exactly, but more or less. So if tilts at 145, doesn't that tell you something? Wow, 145, it basically pars 100. So this thing's like a long-term bond fund. It's not Tesla. It's not General Motors. It's a long-term bond fund, and yet it's trading at a 45% premium. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so what's going to happen when interest rates rise? Well, it'll be trading at 88. And so you can figure out what that means in terms of the rate of return on your investment. My uh, grandmother's account had a, that we bought, we bought a 2005 bond in 1986 that had a coupon of 14%, believe it or not. And that thing paid 14%. Its price traded between 68 and about 140 for the time span that we owned it. We bought it at 68 because we bought it at the peak of inflation. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that, that kind of investment strategy later on. These things really move across their value range. Now let's take a look at um, Corp. This is investment grade. This is PIMCO's investment grade asset, very popular. You can see how it's done. It's high as 110.50. This is investment grade bond, right? So this is, uh, it's a mix of various maturities. And this is the last two years. So it fluctuated between 
up uh, right around par, down as low as about 97, 98, which isn't that bad, and then as high as 110.50. And so nonetheless, this year, this asset had a capital gain of 7%. That's as good as a decent stock. In fact, the S&P has not risen by 7%. The S&P is pretty much flat for the year. You say, wow, 7% gain um, is this due to dividends. No, it can't be due to dividends. We'll explain that in a minute. That's entirely capital gains associated with the fact that interest rates for long-term assets during this year came down because of the switch in direction. The point that I was making about 10 slides ago, where I said the Fed was trying to raise rates, and when the Fed was raising rates, these were coming down to uh, the low levels. Then it switched. And this was before the Fed switch policy. They, they switched before the Fed announced the switch. Ever since they've been rising, and they've been rising like gangbusters. Down there at the bottom, down there when we hit 97.98, November 6, 2018. Right, That's long before the Fed announced their change in policy to lower rates. That's a 2019 phenomenon. Uh, in fact, about six months before. So rates reversed, started to come down. These experienced 7% capital gains, even though they're nothing more than investment-grade intermediate-term bonds. You take a look at junk, same thing. Junk declining precipitously down to 99.6%. And um, now they're back up to near their peak 109. Once again, the decline is explained by the fact that we were raising rates intentionally. And so therefore, everybody's suffering capital losses in this stuff. Then rates reversed, and these experienced sizable capital gains. So these things are just as volatile as stocks in the short run. But they're a little more predictable if you know where interest rates are going to go. Um, this is the same one last year. This is the junk last year, showing two years, okay? So this shows where uh, interest rates were being tightened up by the Federal Reserve System again during this entire period shown here. So these things, and by the way, the, they changed the indexing of this bond uh, in the last year. This was priced at 35. It was a relative change in the index, just tripled the index. Again, they kind of make it close to what it would be relative to par, but it's arbitrary and not actually mathematically exact. But nonetheless, the percentage changes are the same. So this thing falls from 37 down to 35. But then uh, look at the difference in trend. All of it pulled back up. Now, are you sure this is not interest? And this is what you need to understand about ETFs. See the little Ds down there? These ETFs work specifically this way only. They, month, they make typically monthly dividend payments, I mean interest payments, excuse me, based upon the interest they earn. So the price of the asset never reflects interest payouts of any kind. Those are passed on to the owner of the ETF as a direct disbursement. And even though the assets in these funds pay interest semi-annually, these funds are so large and have so many assets that they're able to simply make monthly payments of the same. Now, that's in contrast to, an e to a mutual fund. I, I brought this up in class once before, right? A mutual fund will roll its interest earn into the asset, and that affects the NAV, right? That affects the NAV. This doesn't do that. This is the price of the security itself being reflected on this. Interest payments are cash disbursements to the outside. And that's how they differ from mutual funds. My wife has a lot of these, and she gets big monthly payments all the time from these bonds. They're just cash payments into the fund. Now, to give you an example, this is uh, LQD, the investment grade. And so this shows the distribution of interest uh, per share. As you can see, about 35 cents a month per $100 in par. And so when they earn interest internally, that is paid out as a cash disbursement monthly. And you have the right to tell the broker to keep it in the account, but it is not rolled back into the ETF in any way. So that's what makes it entirely different than a mutual fund. All right? Entirely different than a mutual fund. 
Now that I will ask you on the exam, something about that, because knowing that difference is important. It means when you're looking at a NAV of a mutual fund, that price changing does reflect interest accumulation. When you're looking at the price of an ETF, it does not. That's how they're different. These are the three big ones that I play, and look at how this thing moves. The one's a tilt, LQD, and junk. So tilt is, of course, 30-year treasuries. Uh, LQD is the investment grade corpse, and junk is junk, right? So uh, I'll at least get to the concern slide. Okay, now the, the liquidity risk. I started with that, and we'll end with that. This is, um, this is out of the prospectus of one of these junk bonds. The prospectus, right, of the ETF. Read that there, it says, Fund shares may be more likely to trade at a premium or discount to NAV and possibly face trading halts and or delisting because of liquidity. You will never see that in a prospectus for a stock fund or something like that. That is commonplace in bond funds. If you are an illiquid, relatively illiquid fund, you may have serious problems because they cannot sell these assets at a declining market. And that is warned for explicitly in these funds. So um, I think I'll state the concern, then we'll come back and uh, st uh, start with it next time around. So to conclude, the flood of liquidity justified by recovery from the last deep recession has made it very easy to fund business expansion and international products with junk bonds, meaning bonds rated BB or below. Because of the explosive realities near to all markets in 2017, the effective market yields of these bonds made if these bonds dipped far below any reasonable threshold. And as it goes down to say, there will be a day of reckoning for this. This stuff is all at record low yields, and nothing out there has a yield that even remotely reflects the risk associated with it. The market will eventually correct that, and the correction is going to have a brutal price tag associated with it. I never seem to get to the tax features of bonds and notes slide. I never have in all the years I've taught. <laughs> but it's 4 o'clock, so you are entitled to leave. Just remember, there's a tax features of bonds and notes slide at the very end that I didn't quite get to. All right. Let's hope Harvey Mudd doesn't burn down in the next 24 hours. <laughs> Because all of California is on fire. <laughs> California's burning down. We're part of California. Mm. Oh, I got to stop this. Uh, what are you doing?